Well, hey, podcast family, and welcome to another episode of the L3 Leadership Podcast, where we are obsessed with helping you grow to your maximum potential and to maximize the impact of your leadership. My name is Doug Smith, and I am your host. And in today's episode, you'll get to hear or watch my interview with Sam Chan. I've been following Sam's work for a long time. In fact, Sam wrote the most impactful book that I read on leadership in 2019 called Leadership Pain. If you have not read this book as a leader, it is an absolute must read. Uh, everyone that I recommend it to that reads it says that's exactly what I needed uh, to read at this season of my life. The reality is leadership is hard and leadership is full of painful moments. And this book will really just help you deal with that reality in a really, really practical way. So I'm extremely grateful uh, for Dr. Chan writing this book. And we discussed the book in the interview and so much more. So you're going to absolutely love this. Let me just tell you a little bit about Sam uh, before we dive into the interview. Sam is a former pastor, college president, and chancellor, and now serves as president emeritus at Beulah Heights University. In this season of life, Sam Chan does one thing, and that's leadership. His singular vision for his life is to help others succeed. And literally, this is one of my favorite interviews I've ever done. You're going to get so much out of this. Well, Sam, thank you so much for being willing to do this interview. It's a great honor to get to spend time with you. I know I was telling you just prior to us jumping into the interview how much of an impact your book Leadership Pain has had on me and a lot of the leaders that uh, we have influenced over here at L3 Leadership. So thank you for your work. But for those who may not be familiar with you, can you just start us off by telling us a little bit about who you are and what you do? My name is Sam. I help people. Uh, that's basically it. I'm, I'm uh, married. I've been married to Brenda 31 years. We have two adult children, two grandchildren, one son-in-law. Uh, God's been good to us. I never thought that God would favor me the way he has. No reason for it except the divine providence. And uh, I'm an immigrant. I came to the United States of America in 1973, born and raised in India. So by now you can figure out uh, you know, I'm not from your neighborhood. And, and so uh, uh, that's just been a, a great journey. And so what do I do? I official title is I am a leadership consultant. That's an official shingle, if you want to call it that. But uh, my life vision is helping others succeed. And so that's why I say yes. The reason I say yes is not to be on a podcast. Uh, the reason I write a book is not to write a book the reason is to help others succeed and so that's basically who i am and what i do yeah and you know for anyone who reads your resume uh you are you've been named one of the top 30 leadership gurus on the planet um i know a lot of the leaders that you've been able to mentor and have influence with and you know when people see where you are today i always like to ask leaders what do you wish people knew about your journey uh, that they may not know well, they probably don't know my uh, work ethic. They probably don't know uh, how important every phone call, every uh, email, every text message, uh, how seriously I take it. Because uh, hmm. sometimes people think, you know, people put you in a category and think like, uh, well, they'll just blow us off. And... Uh, uh, I, I don't do that because uh, I've been blown off, blown off before, <laughs> wow. and, and I and I know I I know how sincere I was, uh, and I didn't have name recognition and uh, obscurity is where I was living. So I, you just never know who you who you're helping at what stage of their life, and uh, and I also believe in the sovereignty of God. I believe that this conversation we're having right now. And everyone listening and watching right now is uh, part of the sovereignty of God. So this is a divine appointment. And that's, so I just take it that seriously. I love that. I do want to dive a little bit into that because I'm curious with the level of influence you have, I'm sure you have to say no once in a while. How, how do you determine uh, who gets to spend time with you and, and who doesn't or who gets a response who doesn't? Uh, I'm, I'm just curious because leaders are busy. I, so I have a, I have a very simple criteria for that. My office does that. And that is simply, I want to influence influencers hmm. because if I can be in a room with 10 influencers who are influencing uh, thousands and millions of people, that is uh, a better use of uh, whatever God has entrusted me with. 
than being in front of 10,000 people who may not have a whole lot of influence. Just, just recently, every, every year I do a invitation only a round table somewhere outside the country. And uh, uh, I did one year before last, just use that for example, in Panama City, Panama, there were 24 people in the room, 24 mega leaders in the room, and they all represented 14.5 million people. Wow. So, so that's my criteria. My criteria is simply to say uh, yes to where I can influence influencers. So I'd much rather be in a room of 10 than a room of 10,000 because of that. And I don't know if this is related, but I read this in your book and it stood out for me for some reason on the communication. So you said whatever level someone communicates, whatever medium someone communicates to you with, go a level higher. Uh, so if someone sends you an email, maybe you should give them a phone call. Can you talk about that principle and how you apply that to your life? I just thought that was interesting. Because people always start safe. People want to uh, start at a level that they feel like they're not going to be offensive or they will not feel obtrusive or they will, they will not be invasive. They're trying to be nice. They're trying to be polite. They're trying to be courteous. And I get that. But I also know behind all that courtesy and politeness, there is a little edge to say, uh, this is where we want to start, but can we go higher? And so instead of waiting, uh, waiting through all the drama, I just try to take the conversation higher. Uh, well, of course, they are built on assumptions. I get that. And, and sometimes my assumptions, my instincts are right. Sometimes they're wrong. Uh, but regardless, I try to push the, the envelope a little bit higher that gives them permission to take it higher. And then we keep stepping it up. That's so good. Um, I do want to dive into leadership pain. As I mentioned already, uh, most impactful book that I read in 2019. Uh, every leader I've talked to that's read it said this resonated so much. And you've actually been surprised by the audience. You said everywhere you go, everywhere, people are relating to this book. And the thesis of the book, which I love, is you'll only grow to the threshold of your pain. And can you just give us a little bit about why did you write this book? And, and what do you mean by that thesis that you'll only grow to the threshold of your pain? So one of the things I do, so I, I told you earlier, I'm a leadership consultant and I deliver my consultancy in different formats. Uh, you know, all the way from one-on-one on, one on one with a CEO of a company or a mega church pastor or executive director of a nonprofit like you are. So all the way from there to writing books, podcasts, uh, uh, videos and so on. And one of them is speaking on platforms. And when I would speak on platforms, I realized there were certain questions, doesn't matter what part of the world I was in, that kept coming up again and again. Different variations of the same question, but the same question kept coming up again and again. And one of the questions was, in different variations, was, so what's the difference between a large church pastor and a smaller church pastor, or a large uh, corporate a leader or a smaller corporate leader or a large nonprofit leader or a smaller nonprofit leader. And because the question kept coming up again and again, I started uh, looking at it more carefully because it seemed like people wanted to know, but I did not know. So I started eliminating the, what I thought were common denominators. So I figured out it's not administration, it's really not even leadership, it's not vision, it's not your team, it's not uh, your location, it's not your money. Uh, it really comes down to a very personal thing about the leader, how much pain you can handle. And I started realizing as I got closer because of my work, I can get very personal, very close, very quickly uh, with high level leaders. Uh, and I started noticing they carry a lot of pain, but they don't talk about that pain. They, they talk, the only reason they talk about that pain is to encourage others that I made it, you can too. But when I started delving further, I came up with the one distinctive factor that was common in all leaders that differentiated them was their ability to handle more pain their ability to handle. Now, when I talk about pain, I'm talking about internal pain, external pain, organizational pain, financial pain, relational pain, time management pain, just uh, you know, growth pain, all kinds of different pains. 
Uh, and of course, then I ended up writing that book, Leadership in But The whole notion was uh, the thesis of the book. And the whole book is built on one sentence, which is, you will grow only to the threshold of your pain. The higher you go, the more pain. And that is why a lot of leaders uh, subconsciously and unconsciously put uh, a pause button or sometimes even a stop button in their lives and are not willing to endure any more pain. And that is the end of their uh, leadership uh, fight. That does not mean they are not effective as leaders where they are. They are still effective leaders where they are at. But some the thing inside of them that wants them to go higher and bigger and faster, uh, that I meet very quickly. So that's, that's why I wrote the book, just realizing that people needed to know the one differentiating factor is pain. Yeah, and can you just can you just speak into how can you actually grow your threshold of pain? You you said that it holds so many leaders back. In the book, you talk about how so many visions have been squandered as a result of people's unwillingness to grow through pain. If a leader's listening to this and they're at that threshold of just saying, "I don't know if I can take any more," I don't, but I have this dream in my heart. What would your encouragement to them be? So I've been at that place many many times in my life, many many times in my life, uh, in which I said. Now look, I'm done. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is it. Uh, you know, I, I, thanks for trusting me with all of this, but I, I, I just, uh, I don't know if I can go any, any further with this. And uh, the thing that I think has helped me, which might help others, are a few things. One is, I have some very good friends, maybe five. You know, I know thousands upon thousands of people, but probably I got five such friends whom I call pain partners. There's a whole chapter in the book called pain partners, whom I call pain partners. And pain partners are people with whom I don't, I'm not whining, I'm not complaining. I am not saying woe is me and poor me. Uh, I am, these are people with whom I can transparently say, man, I'm done. You know, I don't need this pain anymore. You know, I can make more money and not have to deal with this. Why do I want to lead an organization when I can just get me a job? Uh, because when I'm leading an organization, I'm never off. I could be uh, on a vacation somewhere or on a cruise somewhere. But this thing, because I'm leading the organization, I used to be a university president. You know, it just kind of lives in your head. I used to be a, a senior pastor. You, you're never off. But, you know, I can tell you many times I've said to my wife, Brenda, I said, I tell you what, I'm just going to get me a job. I will make less money. I get that. I will not have any invitations. I get <laughs> but you know, after five o'clock in the afternoon, I'm done. I can turn my phone off. I can turn my email off. Uh, and when we are on a holiday, when we're on vacation, I don't care who dies. <laughs> I, I don't care whose house burns down. I don't care, you know, I, 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 I can actually shut my life down and actually have a full fledged holiday. So pain partners have really been helpful in which I can just talk to them and them. And they're not trying to fix it either. That's an important thing about pain partners. Wow. These are not answer people. Uh, they are not people saying, you can do it. Come on, Sam, you can. No, nah, that's not a rah-rah place. They are just like the, the, the dumpster. You know, I just dump on them. <laughs> I just dump on them. And after a while, say, thanks for listening. And uh, so that's one thing. The second thing that has really helped me is God's history in my life. Hmm. God's history in my life. And God's history in my life has been that before I go to any, whatever you want to call next level of influence or anything, uh, I've been through a dark night. Mm -hmm. That's been God's pattern and God's history in my life. So because that has been God's pattern of working in my life, it is uh, easier for me to say, okay, I'm hurting right now, but looks like he's up to something good. So let me not waste this crisis. <laughs> let me, let me kind of hang in there and see what he's got on the other side. That's so good. And, and can you just maybe dive a little deeper in that specifically to young leaders? Uh, you talk a lot about in the book, you know, when people start the leadership journey, they have these aspirations and they idolize what leadership is. 
But then when you actually get into the arena, you realize it's, it's nothing like that. And there's consistent statements throughout the book. And I think Craig Rochelle said it, you said it in so many words that before God uses you greatly, he's going to break you. <laughs> and uh, not the most encouraging statement ever, but I think there's a reality to that. So can you just speak to the, the 20 somethings, those in their early 30s, starting out their leadership journey? What advice would you give to them uh, when it comes to this whole subject of leadership pain? So first of all, coming from an old man, wish <laughs> i wish that was a young person's dilemma that i deal with that at 67 almost 68 right now mm, wow. okay so i don't think you it's not the ideal you think about idealism idealism is a gift from god mm. because if we didn't have ideals we would curl up and die even before we started the journey <laughs> You know, idealism says, hey, you can do this. Let's go after it. And then you start getting your buddies together saying, hey, I want to do this. You want to be part of this? I want to start a podcast. Can you help me with that? And, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And so anybody can rain on your parade. But then, you know, I think it is that idealism that uh, gets you into the arena. And the idealism that... Uh, I can do this is what is needed because if we were not idealistic, if we were all realistic, none of us would do anything. Wow. You know, I, I'm an immigrant. I know what it is to eat out of dumpsters. I know what it is to go dumpster diving before it was fashionable. Uh, I know what it is to uh, live on uh, peanut butter jelly sandwiches, uh, half in the afternoon, half in the evening. I, I, listen, so, so, realism would have said you're just an immigrant you are you know you nobody really wants you you speak with an accent half the people don't understand you you don't look like them you don't behave like them so reality is reality i get that but i need somebody in my life who will say who cares what reality is let's go fly reality says gravity is going to pull you down but there were a couple of brothers in North Carolina, Kitty Hawk, who decided to defy gravity. And here we are. So all I'm saying is uh, idealism is good. Don't, and, and listen, can, can I talk to the, some of my older comrades right now? If you are in your other category, you consider older to be. Don't be tamping down on somebody's idealistic dream. It may be crazy to you. Uh, people call me the dream releaser. I have a coaching program called Dream Releaser Coaching. What we do is release people's dreams. Mm -hmm. I, why do I want to become the heavy guy with all the wisdom and the knowledge and experience and lifetime? Say to you, hey, don't do that. That's not good. Do something else. Why do I want to do that? I don't know what God has for you. Be the wind beneath somebody's wings and say, go after it. And don't, don't use the word realistic or idealistic. It, it is somebody's dream is their dream. And who are you to pass judgment on somebody else's dream? Let people dream. And, and I think that is where I would say to everybody, stay idealistic. You can do it. Everybody who did anything at any time in their life did something that at one time was considered impossible. So keep doing it. I love it. Can you dive a little bit deeper into that since you coach people to release their dreams? You know, so step one, it sounds like is don't, don't, uh, you know, don't drain your dream, go after it. But what practical steps do you coach people in, in pursuing their dreams once they have it? So if, if I had a dream to open a hamburger joint, <clears throat> so I have to become a student of hamburgers and hamburger making, <laughs> I'd probably get me a job at McDonald's. Okay, and I may start as a cashier. I might stop, start as a burger flipper. I might start as uh, the drive through order taker. But if I'm going to start a hamburger joint, I've got to be a student of how hamburger joints are run. So if you have a dream, the first thing you got to do is to ask yourself, who else is doing this? And study them, study the person, study the product, study the process, study the whole situation there, and, and then beef up your knowledge and your wisdom and your experience from that. So I think 
you have to reach into your history before you reach into your horizons. And I think that is a tension. But, uh, people keep running towards the horizons, but they have not. So, if, for example, if you want to write a book, then you read books, but also figure out so how are books written and what does the publishing industry look like and those those kind of things. I would just say to people, become a student of whatever your dream is. That's so good. Um, I want to dive into a little tactical leadership and a question I always love asking leaders and a part of this you may have already talked about, but what price did you have to, what are some of the prices that you've had to pay throughout your journey to get to where you are? Oh boy. That almost sounds like I'm some kind of martyr. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, whoa, I paid this high price to be where I am to do what I do. Uh, okay. I think living a disciplined life, I, I'm not OCD. Some people might say that, but I live a fairly disciplined life. Uh, for example, there is not a single person on this planet who can say that I sent Sam Chan a message and he did not respond. Wow. So uh, that's part of the price. That's part of the price. Uh, we may say no, but we will still respond. We may say another time, but we will still respond. So that is part of the price of uh, making sure. And the price that I think I have paid is not holding any grudges. There's not a single person in my life that I hold anything against. There's nobody in this world that is holding me down, uh, carrying no extra baggage. As far as I know, I love everybody and everybody loves me. And if you don't love me, just keep that to yourself. I'm good. I don't need to know that. I don't need to know that. Really, really. I don't need to know that. Uh, so, so the whole the whole notion of uh, I would call personal disciplines that don't necessarily make a list. Uh, the price of uh, making sure that I don't say yes because it's a large opportunity. Uh, I have said yes to a smaller opportunity, smaller, however you want to quantify that. And then a larger opportunity came around and the, my, my carnal self wanted to cancel the smaller opportunity for the larger opportunity. Uh, but my integrity says, no, you've already made that commitment. Uh, you can feel the disappointment. Don't deny the disappointment saying, wish I had not. I wish I had waited. Uh, you can go through all of that, but keep your word. Uh, I think those are what I call personal disciplines. They're, they're not the glamorous list that you can make of personal prices, but those are the kind of things that happen with daily living, daily decision making. Uh, but I don't know if... I mean, I paid a lot of prices, but at that time they looked really large. Looking back on it, ah, that's part of the pay that you do to get ahead. Hmm. Yeah, talk about getting ahead. I, I guess, do you have any advice for leaders looking to get ahead? Or, you know, Jack Welch always says, get out of the pile. Uh, what advice would you have for young leaders looking to get out of the pile and stand out? I think, uh, boy, that's a great question. I, I remember, I remember I was... Uh, at this church conference one time and a very, very senior leader. Uh, at that time, he was uh, 60 or some years of old age and he seemed ancient to me. You know, now <laughs> I am him. You know, he seemed ancient to me and I was uh, 26 at that time. Yeah, I was 26 at that time. And uh, he put his arm around me and he, this is what he said to me. And it, ha it has been gold for me. He said, mm -hmm. Brother Sam, in those days, everyone called each other brother and sister. <laughs> yeah, yeah, those are wonderful days. So he said, Brother Sam, live long and live clean. Live long, live clean. Well, at that time, it didn't make a whole lot of sense for me. But I have found that, yeah. Uh, the race does not belong to sprinters. The race belongs to plodders. 
just plod away. Just one step at, at next, in front of the other. It, you, it, it, is, it is a marathon, just keep plodding away. And so live long. That simply means the longer you live and you live clean. Live clean means keep your family first, don't mess around, you know, keep your zipper up. Uh, just, just, just uh, do the right things, make good choices, uh, lie to people, don't try to make a fast buck, stay married, be, uh, uh, be a person of integrity, keep your word. That's what he meant. Now it all makes sense to me. Uh, that's it, you know, that was 30 some years ago, but I still remember him saying, Sir Sam, live long, live clean. And can I tell you what, what, uh, what prompted him to say that? So, you know, I'm 26 and I'm one of those guys asking questions. I walk up to him. He's successful in what he's doing. And I say to him, his name was brother Chester Miller, Chester Miller. And I said to him, brother Miller, if you could give me one piece of advice, what would that be? You know, I'm looking for, you know, that, that question, what is the one piece of advice you can give me that will take me to the next level? And he put his arm around me. And that's when he said to me, brother Sam, live long, hmm. live clean. That's so good. One of, one of our values here at L3 is character development. We think character development is the most important development. And I'm just curious, as, as you've worked with leaders, how, how do leaders grow and develop their character? You know, you just mentioned a bunch of phrases that, that sound great and obviously would build up a life of character, but how can we actually build character in others? I'm just curious how you view that. That's very difficult to do. If that was easy, we wouldn't have any wrecks to read about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I have over the years, I've had lots of my friends who messed up, who messed up in the financial dealings, who messed up with uh, trying to make a fast buck, who messed up in their marriages, had affairs, who medicated their pain with alcohol and drugs and illicit activities, gambling and so on and so forth. Uh, who, and these, were, these are good people. These are godly people. And some of them pastors of large churches. Uh, some of them husbands and fathers and grandfathers that uh, you would have thought are brilliant people. How could they... They throw it all away with us one night stand. How could they do that? Were they not people of character? And to me, character is uh, well, that's a huge question. So let me give, give me a minute to answer that. So let me just tell you how character is destroyed. Character is destroyed in three steps, and we find that in Psalm chapter 1, verse 1, where the psalmist says to us, Blessed is the man who walketh not number two is standeth not number three is sitteth not I'm, I'm i'm doing it from the king james version because it is uh it is just i'm a king james guy but no no i'm niv and message and living bible i'm all that so uh so but but in this quotation blessed is the man who walketh walking is your first step towards sin that's the anatomy of sin standing is the second step Sitting is the third step. Nobody starts off by sitting. So that means if you, if you ended up having an affair, for example, not throwing stones at anybody, I was saying if you ended up having an affair, it didn't happen just like that, that you and your wife had a fight, so you ran down the road and picked up somebody and had sex with them. That's not how it happens. It started on a slippery slope. You were walking by, you were watching things you shouldn't be watching. You were, you were looking at stuff on your phone that you shouldn't have. You were reading stuff that you shouldn't have. You, you were going through time, you were just walking. But in your peripheral vision, you could see stuff. And then you stood there long enough to be enticed by it, being attracted by it, being seduced by it. And then you end up sitting down. Character development, I've got to, I've got to deconstruct this whole notion and say to myself, who am I walking with? Who am I standing with? And who am I sitting with? And that is where it is very important for you to have truth tellers, truth tellers in your life. 
Daddy will say things like, Sam, uh, everything okay between you and Brenda? I noticed that you guys have been short with each other. Uh, Sam, the, the, the way you re re replied to her, everything okay there? Uh, Sam, you used to respond to my emails and my text messages, but now uh, used to do it every day. I mean, if I send you a message, you respond the same day, but now it takes you three, four days. Uh, are you okay? Somebody just needs to raise a question and ask a question. And I can tell you, most of us are afraid of hurting other people's lives. And we, and we are not, we don't love them enough to risk our relationship, to raise the issue and ask the question. So over the last 35, almost 40 years, I'm known for raising the issue and asking the question. I'd much rather lose you as a friend and I'd much rather hurt your feelings. I'm not gonna do that on purpose. I'm gonna be very respectful. I'm not gonna be like a bull in a china shop. I'm not gonna come accusing. I'm not going to be throwing stones at you, but I will ask you the question. I will say, Sam, are you dry now? Are you still drinking? Sam, uh, how are things at home? Sam, are you still watching that stuff? Sam, who is monitoring that stuff? Sam, have you broken that relationship off? Sam, have you paid that money back? Sam, are you still gambling? I, I ask those questions because how... I found, I found out how more people are, uh, are, are what uh, look to or work towards keeping the relationship than keeping that friend from the ditch. That's I'd much true. rather build a fence at the top of the hill than build a hospital at the bottom. Hmm. I'm just one of those guys. I'm wired like that. My wife will tell you I have knocked on people's doors at 11 o'clock at night saying, you should be home. Are you home? Wow. That's so good. I'm, I'm, I'm known to do that because I, I loved you enough to not let you slip into a ditch. That's, that's at least what I do. So I love that on the front end. Can you, can you talk to leaders who may be listening to this and they might say, man, I wish I, I would have had a friend like that six months ago, but man, I've, I've fallen. And you, you talked about you've had many friends fail. What is the other side of, of having a fail look like? And what's your encouragement to leaders who may have found themselves in a situation they, they didn't want to be in, but uh, found themselves in? So let me start by asking a very insensitive question, and then I will answer that question. The insensitive question would be, so how come you didn't have any real friends? Wow. What was it about you? What was it about you that kept people, uh, you call them friends, but they're really mere acquaintances? They, are, they were well-known acquaintances. So what was it about you that did not invite people into your life to be the kind of people that you needed in that moment? Having said that, that's an intrusive question, but that has to be a question that is asked somewhere in the front end to become introspective about our enabling behavior that keeps people at arm's length and does not allow them to come in. The second thing I would ask them so what lesson have you learned? Are you still trying to do life alone? Or are you, have you changed that behavior? Who is speaking into your life? Who, and I'm, the question is not who are your mentors, who are your guides, who is, uh, you know, who is your consultant, who's your coach? I think all those are fair questions, but that's not the question. The real question is who have you given permission to? to speak into your life. So I have five such people in my life that have permission to ask me any question they want to ask me without any disclaimers, no offense taken, ask me anything you want to ask me. In fact, there are times I'll call them and say, uh, is there anything you want to say to me? Is there any question on your mind? Is there anything you are seeing in my life that is, uh, you think, you're wanting to say, and you just uh, don't know how to bring up the topic. Let me bring up the topic. You talk to me because I'd much rather deal with that myself and put myself in a position that uh, it places others at risk and my relationship at risk. So I, I think most people do not learn from the behaviors 
that got them into it to begin with. Remember, I talked about walking, standing, sitting. So who are you walking with? Who are you standing with? Who are you sitting with? Sam, that is unbelievable. Thank you so much for sharing that insight. Uh, I do want to dive into the lightning round, but before we do, you know, for those listening to this interview, you have many services that you offer to leaders. Can you just talk about a few of the services that you offer, how people can connect with you? And I believe you also have a special offer specifically uh, during this time during COVID-19. So Yeah. Thank you for, uh, for bringing that up. I'm very frustrated right now. And my frustration is uh, people are home might have a little more time to increase their leadership, but cash is low or they've been careful with their cash. So I have a leadership program called Sam Chan Leadership Institute. And for years and years, we have been marketing that all over the world. We have thousands of people subscribe to that and they pay 2000 US dollars, 2000 US dollars a year to get the 12 month program. So what do you get for 12 months? You get uh, one of my books every month, so 12 books that I've written every month. Uh, you get four videos a month that support that book. And at the end of the 12 months, you get a certificate of completion. We are saying to ourselves, how can we help people and not worry about the money part? So we're calling this the COVID offer or whatever you want to name your price offer. This is what you will do. If you go to a website, let me give the website now. It is samchandleadership.com slash COVID, C-O-V-I-D. I'll give that to you in a, again in just a moment. What happens there is it'll ask you two questions. One is what's your contact information so we can start sending you material. And the second question is how much do you want to pay? You put in whatever. Please hear me now. Whatever you want to pay in there. Uh, no questions asked. No negotiating, no back and forth. No one's going to say that is too low or unacceptable. Whatever you say, you get in the program. Imagine for a moment you go to a restaurant and you sit down, you look at the menu, and there are all the menu items and no prices. And you call your server over, you say, Sir, sir, there are no prices here. What, what, what are we going to pay? And he says, Enjoy your meal and whatever you want to pay. Whatever you want to pay on the way out, whatever you want to pay, just pay that. That's the deal here. So you will get 12 books. It's everything online, everything digitized, 12 books, each of all of them written by me. Uh, you get four videos a month that will support each book that month and a certificate of completion for whatever you want to name. So here's the website again, samchandleadership.com slash COVID. Uh, you can, uh, all the listeners can do this. Uh, you want to pass it on to your entire companies. I know right now of the enti entire churches are doing this, uh, uh, entire leaderships are doing this, uh, entire companies are doing it because it's no money out of your church. It's no money out of your company. It is up to the people. All they need to know is we want to increase. So thank you so much for allowing me to just lessen my frustration during this time of how do I get people raise the leadership. Sure. And leaders, if you're listening to this, we'll include links to all of that in the show notes and throw it in L3 emails as well. Uh, so look for that. And I encourage you to sign up and pay what you can pay. So thank you for adding value to leaders in that way, Sam. Um, as we start to close out, I always love taking leaders through my lightning round questions. And so let's just dive right in. My first question is, what is the best advice you would ever, you've ever received and who gave it to you? Uh, it was Brother Chester Miller. <laughs> 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 live long, live clean. Love it. Love it. Uh, it may be the same answer. If you could put a, a quote on a billboard for everyone to read, what would it say? Uh, I would put one word, others. Hmm. Say more about that. Like, I wish somebody had told me in my earlier years, it's not about you. Hmm. I think Rick Warren said it best in his Purpose Driven Life. Uh, it's not about you wasn't around writing those books at that time he was around but not writing books at that time like that so i just want it's, it's about others if you live your life for others you'll be fine what's the best purchase you've made in the last year for a hundred dollars or less oh i got me a jacket at nordstrom rack it was it was in my size it was hiding it is a, i just love it it is uh 
like like crinkly blue with a black collar, white buttons. I mean, it it, it just pops. So it you know if I stand <laughs> if I stand with some cool jeans, uh, a white shirt and that jacket on a platform, it just looks great on a screen. So yeah, yeah, I'm I'm being like that. <laughs> I love it. Uh, what books have you read in the last year that have made a great impact on you that you'd recommend? I tell you, I'd like to recommend a book that I read about 40 years ago, maybe 30 years ago, that I can't get away from. And I've recommended that book than any other book apart from the Bible that has influenced my life and how I live my life. And that is a book by Seth Godin. And it is called Purple Cow. Purple <laughs> as in color, cow as an animal affected my thinking, how I make decisions. Uh, much of what I do uh, is done to the grid. It's just a little, little book. You will probably end up reading it in less than two hours, less than two hours. But it was a life changer for me and still remains that way. So uh, I thought I would give that because it has affected me that deeply after all those years. What are you passionate about right now? Influencing influencers and creating content. I want to keep thinking, creating content, and I want to influence influencers. And God has allowed me to do both of those at a level I never thought I would. And uh, so I'm very aware of his providence in my life. And I'm very much aware of the weight of stewardship of that in my life as well. So yeah, creating content, influencing influencers. What are, what's your greatest challenge right now? My greatest challenge is how do I get out so much that's on paper? I got stacks of notes and uh, I'm working on literally uh, 13 books right now at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> guy. I am very frustrated. I don't, it's like having 13 children and which one are you going to feed first, you know? So, uh, it's, uh, it's just like that. So I've done two books this year already. Well, one is already out mm -hmm. called The Sequence to Success. The other one will be out uh, in September called Tensions, uh, The Power of Tension. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's another book I, that is due to my publishers in April. I have no idea which one of the 13 is going to end up that. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, do you have a favorite failure in your life that ended up leading to success or a great lesson? Yeah, when I applied for a job that I thought I was suited for and I did not even get a response back. Mm. I carried that for a long time and uh, I could not get ahead. And the reason I could not get ahead is because that became uh, shackles around my feet. I had to let go of that rejection. That re and, and more than the rejection, it was e nobody even respected me enough to say no. Hmm. That got ignored. So yeah, that's it. Do you, um, you get to spend time with a lot of great leaders. I'm just curious, do you have uh, any go-to questions that you always ask when you get a meeting with a leader? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, by now you know how I'm wired. So this is what I would say. I would say, Doug, how are you doing? Hmm. You'll tell me. I'll say, no, really, how, how are you doing? You'll tell me. That's it. Uh, 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 please don't mind me asking that question <laughs> again. How are you really doing? Wow. Well, you know, I'm doing well. I've got a few things I'm working through. So do you care to talk about those things? And so, yeah, that's my question. I, I, I am, I know I'm in a place in my life. I'd much rather lose you as a friend and keep you out of the ditch. Hmm. Uh, aside from your family, what is your most worthwhile investment of your time and money? Uh, at this given time, you, hmm. I live in the moment. I dance in the moment. So I'm not looking for, you know, right now I've got a bunch of calls lined up as you do and everybody does right now. Uh, but right now I'm giving you a hundred percent of what I've got. I'm holding nothing back. I'm not looking at my watch. I'm not looking at anything. Uh, so I have learned to dance in the moment, give it 100% of who I am right then. So right now, you are it. Thank you. Do you have any unusual habits that enable you to be successful? Uh, I've got a bunch of them, uh, all the way from unusual to weird. Uh, <laughs> 
But let, let me give you one of them. I live by what I call the Ohio principle, O-H-I-O. My wife taught that to me years ago in the 80s, somewhere in the mid 80s. And this is what it is. It's a, it stands for Ohio, only handle it once. Hmm. That means if I get a text message from you, I will just answer it right then. I only handle it once. So I have nothing that's waiting to be done. And now if you send me a long email with a lot of stuff in it, I will still respond to you and say, hey, got your email, I'll be back with you. But uh, oh, yeah, that, that habit has kept me, uh, kept me focused. Do you have a morning routine? And if so, what is it? Yeah, I, I wake up in the morning. That's a good thing. Uh, there would be no routine <laughs> if you didn't wake up. <laughs> uh, then I uh, uh, calm down for a moment in the, in the way of just getting my thoughts, call it meditation or whatever you want. Uh, just a, a, a small time uh, of just uh, being myself. Then I will get on my roar in my uh, house and I will try to get a good cardio out of that. I'm not trying to be a weightlifter or anything like that. Uh, I just want to keep my, my ticker healthy. So I'll get myself a good cardio and I tell you what, a roar will kick you, kick you every part of your body. <laughs> so I will do that. Uh, then I will clean up. Uh, then I'll have breakfast with my wife and we'll pray together. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, what's happening in her life, what's happening in my life, what the day holds. Uh, we have a time of uh, prayer for people we want to pray for at that time. If, we, if there are any phone calls to be made that we need to make together, like this morning, I just called my sister in India. It is her birthday. So, you know, those kind of things. Uh, we'll do <clears throat> personal things, and then we will jump into what the day holds for us on a professional level. But I do all my personal stuff. I invest in myself, uh, in my devotional life, in my personal life, in my physical life, in my relationship life at the front end of it, and then go into the day. Do you have anything left? That, what's one item left on your bucket list if you have one? Yeah, I don't, I think I would like to write a book on, I cannot talk about the topic right now, but I'd like to write a book on that subject. Uh, I don't know if anyone will read it. I think it'll be more cathartic. Like I told you. <laughs> <laughs> and a book. Okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think that's on my butt. I, I really want to make a list, name names and do that. <laughs> I look forward to the release of that one. Yeah, um, yeah, no, I'll make more money on that book by not releasing it. <laughs> um, if you could go back and have coffee with 20-year-old Sam, what would you tell him? I said to him, relax. You don't have to get it all done today. You don't have to get it done today. Just do your best today. And I would say to my 20-year-old Sam, focus on today, not tomorrow. Not yesterday, today. Because tomorrow will be more of whatever you do today. So what are you doing today that you can carry into tomorrow? But tomorrow is not the issue today. I spent so much of my time worrying about yesterday and planning for tomorrow. And somehow I miss today. today. At the end of your life, what do you want to be remembered for? What do you want your legacy to be? Uh, he was a good husband. He was a good father. He was a good grandfather. Mm -hmm. He loved his family. Anything else you want to leave leaders with today? Yeah, I want to thank you for what you're doing and, and, and the gift God that you are to everybody that is following you. You haven't said in much about L3. And so can I just turn the tables on you just for a moment? Sure. So why, why, why L3? Why the name or why did we start this? As you start, yeah. Yeah, so, so my life was a, a complete wreck before I was 17. Uh, I lost my mom uh, when I was 17 years old, senior of high school. Christ came into my life at that point in a significant way. And I had two mentors come into my life. One was my, he wasn't at the time, but my father-in-law and one was a youth pastor. And they both saw leadership potential in me and started giving me leadership resources. Uh, like John Maxwell, they introduced me to Gerald Brooks, who I know is a friend. And I just, for whatever reason, the way God wired me, he gave me this passion to learn, grow and develop. And at the end of the day, I just said, I want to do for other leaders what, what these two men have done for me. 
And so we started a leadership development organization and we don't want any leaders to do life alone. That's one of our core values is community. And so we just want to connect and develop leaders and see what the Holy Spirit does. And uh, we do that through five different things. We do, uh, we have this podcast, which comes out with new content every week. Uh, we have a membership community where people join the community and they have access to leadership resources, the community. We have mastermind groups where leaders meet together uh, twice a month to grow and develop. We have a leadership program and we have a one day leadership conference here in Pittsburgh. And so uh, that's why we started and that's what we do. Well, bless uh, everything that your heart is at and may the Lord exceed every dream that, that you have and more leaders be uh, blessed by you. Uh, thank you for not letting your deficiencies in your earlier years hold you back, but you're giving back to what you did not have. And thank you so much for this time to be able to just sit and chat with you. Hey leader, I think it's more important now than ever that you have a community of leaders to do life and leadership with. And that's exactly why we created L3 Leadership. And we've spent the last three months revamping and relaunching our entire membership platform just for you. And it is absolutely incredible. We are more passionate now than we have ever been about developing leaders. And so we're actually, we believe in the product so much that we created that we are giving you your first two months of membership free. Now, when you become a member, you're gonna get access to live webinars with nationally known leaders that you'll have access to um, for members only. You'll have access to all of our L3 one day talks. You'll get to connect with all the other L3 members and have a community of leaders to do life and leadership with and so much more. And so this offer for two free months is only good through May 1st. So make sure that you sign up today. We are absolutely thrilled with the fact that you could become an L3 leader. So join today.